Scotland. Now, it's Roberta Baroni on BBC Three Counties Radio. You know what's been a fantastic show? What a tremendous panel. First panel of the week. Thank God, yes. What a, and this is like the A-team. This is like all-star A-team. They're here and they're amazing. Uh, welcome back to Jonathan Davis, Independent Wealth Manager from Hertfordshire. Good to see you again, Jonathan. And you, Rob. Uh, Paul Ryan, actor, coach, writer, man of all things. Really. I'm exhausted. All, Lovely to see you. Time. And you. <laughs> and Jeremy Silverson, marketing expert from Potter's Bar. Oh, I feel so inadequate. No, in this you're company <laughs> you're all very good we are going to talk about whether business is offering enough staff training on the back of the uh, Starbucks story every single Starbucks store in North America has been closed today for staff training I think as they try to uh, avert an illegal action and if you lend money to your children should you ask them to sign a contract just some of the stories we're going to look at later on this evening uh, but panel can we start with the WH Smith story um it's been voted. They've been voted the worst, the worst retailer on the UK high street in a survey of more than 10,000 consumers. Consumers complained the shops were out of date, products were expensive, and staff were rude in the survey carried out by the Hartford based consumer group, which now cosmetics chain Lush, discounter Savers, and toy shop uh, toy chain Smith Toys came top in this customer satisfaction survey. But why is there no love? for WH Smith, Mr Ryan. Well, can I just say before we go any further that in my WH Smiths in Berkhamsted, the staff are always extremely pleasant. I mean, that's really important that I point that out. But they're lonely because it's ever so quiet in that store now. It's really, really quiet. And I think it's fair criticism. It hasn't moved with the time. The, the shops are overstuffed with product and it's, it's expensive. It's really expensive. So you go in there and you feel like you're back in the 70s, except it's without the crowds. How long will it last on the high street in this day? I don't know. Is it expensive or is it that other retailers have come in in, in the last few years mm -hmm. and, and have been taking away bits of their business and doing it cheaper? Good question. Now, all I, all I can think about is the Mars bar, the humble Mars bar, when we used to judge the economy against the price of a Mars bar. Mm. Look at you, Jonathan. And I, rem I remember going into a WH Smith about six years ago and swooning at the cost of, of, a, of a humble Mars bar. So I don't know. You might have a point there, but certainly it does seem that you're paying a bit over the odds all the time and they're not being competitive. That's the problem. And they've got to be if they're a high street store, haven't they? I appreciate the dilemma. You know, it's all going away. It's going online. It's going to cheaper retailers, but they've got to come up with something. They've got to be imaginative, got to be creative to keep their place because I'd be really sad to lose W8 Smith. I would. Jonathan, what's your take on this? Um... It seems to me that WH Smith um, is in the late 20th century. It ha doesn't appear to have moved with the times. Um, it doesn't know where its place is. It's not uh, discount. It's not high end. Um, I, I don't know if it knows who its customers are. Um, it, it's providing products um, which... Um, are uh, you know apart from the uh, t tobacco uh, sweets and newspapers, which you know you go in and you come out, uh, the the books and the pencils and the fancy pens. I mean, they're gift items that come out at Christmas and birthdays. Um, it does seem to me it's a it's a, a retail model that uh, is not really of its time the, in 2018. It, it does seem confusing. I mean, they've got big presences on some of the big shopping centres, very expensive stores, of course, mm. railway stations. Uh, but you're right; it's like a scattergun approach. They've got a bit of everything. I'm not sure if in, in the modern retail environment, a bit of everything is enough to see you through. Um, you want to have everything if you're uh, an online uh, setup. Amazon's the obvious uh, example. Uh, as uh, as uh, as you say there, um, I I just wonder how they're going to get people to go through their doors uh, to buy something more than a newspaper. And we also know newspapers sales are going down as well. Um, it, it it's not a company that has long for the high street. I would suggest the reason why it stays in business is its distribution uh, side. Um, it's the national distributor of all the newspapers, and, and well. it makes it makes a lot of money that way. They sell the magazines. All the newspapers, all the magazines, Jeremy. They go. They, they, when you go to the bigger stores, you, you are, you can be pleasantly surprised by all the various ranges of magazine. A magazine for everything, but I don't see many people paying five, six quid for a colourful magazine these days. 
No, and if they if they want a magazine, they're just as likely to pick it up in the local supermarket. So, you know, it seems oh, like it's it's been their, squeezed their range, out. Gee, the supermarkets sell the basic stuff, but yeah. Smith have got you know they have a there'll be a magazine about and they potting sheds. They, they've got they've got magazines for <laughs> everything. You've been into Tesco in Potter's Park. Yes. I know you have, Rob. And, and, and Potting Weekly is in there proudly. Um, I, I'm amazed. I'm gobsmacked, actually, that WH Smiths has, has topped or bottomed this poll. Um, clearly, none of those people have been into PC World. Um, they, you know, other computer stores are available. But it, it does strike me as if they're increasingly trying to set themselves up as a bit of a premium brand without actually adding the value to it. So they're getting squeezed from all sides. Um Okay. You know, retailers can survive. The high street retailers can survive, mm, but well, they have to do something. On different. the other side of the coin, okay, uh, the discounter savers has come in one of the top three places here, but they just do stuff a little bit cheaper. There's not much of a customer experience, but I think it's because it's cheap. Uh, Smith's Toys, well, it's toys. Who doesn't get excited at toys? Mm. And the competition's gone. Lush, for example. Now, I don't imagine any one of us around the table have any real experience I only go in oh but you're wrong dear man <laughs> yeah, there we go now when was the last time I put I, my money on you Paul I, yeah, it was Christmas it's always Christmas I go twice a year Christmas Eve yeah. and, and my daughter's birthday both to get, mm. both times to get some some smelly soap for my daughter and they try to grab my hand to put some sort of special soap I said I don't want to don't touch me don't touch me just give me a box oh give in to it no give me a box with a ribbon on it <laughs> yeah exactly it's a wonderful I think the thing about Lush is it's terrific even before you've walked in because there's this terrific aroma and it's warm and it's inviting and again you know it's busy everything looks beautiful and yeah it is high end and you're happy to pay the price because the quality is good and the customer experience is excellent the staff are very well great it is a sensory experience Mm. Mm. isn't it which you can't get over the internet as easily but but you know th- there are retailers Zara I, would, I think is one of them that proves that even as a fashion retailer you can do well on the high street provided you've got a, a good online presence as well that complements it. Jonathan Davis, have you, have you ever been into Lush? I certainly have. My my daughters uh, love it. it. It's a great, as uh, someone said uh, here, it's a great sensory experience. I, I think it particularly is attractive for young girls who who love. Uh, who are into crafty things, crafts, um, and uh, I, I, I seem to recall you can actually play around with the soap, uh, liquid soap, and make things. And of course, you get the uh, the, um, the 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 smell uh, experience as well. You can get all the different smells. Um, I, I've been in it. I don't stay in it very long. I let I go outside and I say, I'll I'll see you when you come out. How do, you, how do you choose the price? I just, I, they, I just say the price band. I, I, I want to spend. I don't know anything about those soaps. They look like chocolates and like biscuits. And, mm. I think no. I, I want. I'm going to spend this much as part of the, the. I want to spend this, and I want a big ribbon on it. Well, I suppose it all depends how well you think your daughters might be informed about the price of things. Because the thing about Lush is when you give it to somebody they go oh and they immediately feel special that's something really intriguing Mm. isn't it about their product they feel treated nicely if you give them something from lush because it has that that special quality about it uh, another money story for us to have a look at. By the way, you can text the program 81333, start the text 3. Uh, London has introduced a contactless payment system for buskers in what the organisers claim is a world first. Uh, in addition to tossing loose change to a box, passersby can use card readers to make contactless payments to buskers. Uh, is this the proof, if it were needed, Jeremy, that money is dead? Real money. Well, I don't think um, money is dead, but um, obviously the way that we transact um, may be moving on. And it's only right that buskers as part of the rich fabric of London should move with it. So I think it's it's a, a great improvement and, uh, you know, it will allow people to donate even when they don't have any cash in their pocket. So I'm all for it. So how much do you have to donate if you're giving you plastic then? That's the thing. Some, if I don't know really, if there's a minimum £5 pound transaction. If they're really good, if they're really good and I'm in the right mood, 50p maybe. If it's a song I really like, like an oasis, a pound. But um, would you start, what, would you start doing £5 pound on, on the debit card? Well, you don't have to. You, you can do any amount on, on your card, can't you? You see, so, it'll be very interesting, won't it, to see the mechanism. Do you have a choice of three buttons, 50p a pound, two quid or whatever? But, I mean, I, I have failed, actually, as a busker. I was a dreadful, dreadful busker. And I remember once singing this song. Hang yeah, on, hang on, There's all... a story here. And it's where, a very sad one. Where, oh, no, where and yeah. when? They're the best ones, by the way. I was along the Euston Road, and I was only about 16, and I had a little acoustic nylon string guitar, and I was singing <laughs> a song that I'd written myself. Hang on, it was 
disastrous. What were you singing? Oh, I was singing a thing called Christmas is Coming, the Goose is... You know, it was nonsense. But the point the point I want to make is... Oh, I that think I'm, I saw you. Do you? Were you the one that gave me the ten pence? <laughs> Literally, the point is that this lady walked past, you took pity on me, and she said, what do you want, dear? And I went, well, whatever you can afford. And she, she held out a ten piece. I had to stop playing and hold my hand out for the money. Now, here's the thing. Are the buskers going to have to stop playing and hold out the plastic machine? Because it's going to ruin it, in it? And also, one of the things, whenever I give money, to buskers i drop it in quick because i feel a bit embarrassed whereas this is going to prolong the whole um situation really and cause uh, emotional agonies i don't know i like your thinking i like your thinking jeremy but i think it's going to steal a little bit of the soul from instant music jeremy um sorry jonathan he indeed he's looking at me I know. <laughs> um as you say there paul you, you walk towards a busker or you're going down the escalator in the tube and you you're you're deciding if you're going to give them something you quickly throw it into the hat or the the violin case the guitar case and you move on what are we going to do are we going to stop look for their 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 card reader um contact list clink bing and they um put in uh, uh, type in how much it, it's <laughs> really going to change how we yeah. um, uh, 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 give money to buskers. Um, y- you did raise another issue, which I think is going to be interesting, about the death of money mm. in your pocket. Um, and there's no question that we use plastic more now, this is a simple fact, than we use actual cash. And, uh, I- and I would say to you that um, this is go- This is yet another example of how the government, whoever the government will be, will eventually ban cash, as indeed they've done in a couple of major countries around the world already. Um, La- um, India is a famous example. Um, and this concerns me greatly that eventually, and I can see it happening within, certainly within a generation and probably within 10 years, they will ban cash. And uh, that, from a libertarian, a freedom point of view, concerns me greatly because the state will know every single thing that you do. Mm. Indeed they will. Right, so we'll take some travels, come back, and we'll take a call from Martin. The programme has been very good today. Three Counties Radio. Um, Jonathan, Paul and Jeremy with us this evening. They're great guests. Martin, good, after- good evening to you, Martin. Good evening, Roberto. What I said What I said Welcome to the show. What's in your mind? I'm just driving back from work from Leighton Buzzard towards Milton Keynes on the A4146 that goes down to Newton Lees alongside the railway line and the Flying Scotsman was going the other way. What, the Flying Scotsman? <laughs> yeah, the flies for the choo-choo train, the big, big green thing pulling one red carriage behind it. Quite, quite a sight, really. Yeah, I mean, that must be a wonderful sight. Yeah, if it was, it was chuffing away like a good one. <laughs> Are you sure it was the Flying Scotsman? Yeah, because the, re- the reason I left it so late, because I got a tip off some, uh, the wife at home, she, she sent me a thing saying it was coming that way to make sure I drove on that road on the way home, so I did. Oh, fantastic. Well done, you. I'd love to see that. Mm. Martin, have a safe journey. Thank you for your call, sir. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you. Uh, Adam in St. Albans says, Gents, it's a standard £2 contactless card donation. Um, Two quid. I know. Rob, I've seen the picture of the buskers. It's this text. The payment is £2 and the machine is resting on a suitcase. She doesn't stop playing and there's another case for real money. This is a big bitch. Uh, well, that makes it a little bit more like £2, pounds, sense, though. It's two just, quid's a lot of money, isn't it? Really, that'd be really good to get two quid. Yeah. <laughs> this text is I buy uh, pen refills from Smith I would have to borrow Bookie's pens otherwise so <laughs> and, and do you know what I was, I was in WS Smith last week to buy a refill because they do sell those but everything else is so expensive mm. uh, you can talk about these stories if you want you can text the programme 81333 start your text 3CR um, panel every Starbucks store in North America has been closed today or is closed uh, as they embark on a day of staff training the coffee chain is giving all its US staff unconscious buyers training after protests against the treatment of uh, black customers at some of its stores. This occurred when uh, two gentlemen went in and were waiting to host a meeting in one of the stores and some of the staff reacted uh, very uh, inappropriately and it's all kicked off, of course. Um, how important is staff training? Paul Ryan. 
Well, staff training is vital on any level and for a whole host of different reasons. If you think about public safety, if you think about product, but also treatment of treatment of customers. And what was very interesting about this story when you pointed it out to me today was that in my first note was, yeah, OK, unconscious bias. I can see that having a relevance in America, but actually maybe I'm being an optimist, but I, I kind of don't think we need it over here. But then I saw the news item that was on the BBC and it was really enlightening and they said look we're all a little bit unconsciously biased it's the way our brain works so if there's if there's room for this training to help us and it was fascinating as well because the people that went on the course they shot them before and they said well I'm looking forward to this it'll be interesting and they were kind of quietly dismissing the whole subject and afterwards their thought processes had been a little shaken and they went you know what I am I am going to be more aware because I can see there are differences in the way that I view people from different racial backgrounds than I do my own racial group as it were so I think it's only for the good Jonathan uh, this is a case of where the phrase PC politically correct nonsense was invented um, this all sprung up because a, a month or two back uh, in a Starbucks what do you call it a store a, a bar a coffee bar a coffee shop <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't um, think they know it's a it's just Starbucks, yes. Um, a, 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 a guy um, who, who uh, was, um, a, I think, an unemployed individual, um, he wanted to come in, not buy a coffee, and use their, what they call the restroom, the, the bathroom. And uh, the staff declined, the staff forbid the person from using the restroom um, for whatever reason. And uh, the mainstream media in the US picked it up and decided to call Starbucks racist. Well, this was not racism. This was company policy um, that every manager of a coffee shop uh, has discretion as to who can use their free services. And for whatever reason, this particular individual was declined. So Starbucks has spent a vast amount of money uh, on consultants, um, on uh, PR and media guys. I'm sure Jeremy's got something to say about this on marketing uh, and perception uh, of uh, of its brand. Um, this is a storm in a coffee cup. <laughs> very good. Thank very you very well. much. Well done. Uh, Stephen Dunst was Rob Unconscious Bias. Swap one bias for another. It's ridiculous. Um, Jeremy. Um Unconscious bias, I think, is a really interesting area. But the reality is that, that conscious or otherwise, it is racism, it is ageism, it is sexism. It's all of those things that make us a little bit less likely to engage with people, to, um, to associate with people who are unlike us. And irrespective of the, the background to this particular case... I think being more aware that that uh, most people are unconsciously and subconsciously more likely to choose to be with people like them is actually the first step in making sure that we can become more diverse, and more inclusive. And I think that can only become a good thing. Certainly we see it in, to a huge degree within businesses in the UK where we have middle class, middle aged white men on boards of directors who will routinely routinely recruit middle, middle, middle class, middle aged white men uh, to replace them. And of course, it just perpetuate, perpetuates the same sense of, of, of feeling and ambition. So nothing ever changes. So being aware that you are actually being unconsciously biased. Um, does allow you to at least open your mind to the possibility of being less biased. Um, in this particular case, yeah, I, I, I understand the background to it. Um, but, it, you know, the reality is that we, we do all need to be more inclusive. And it, it does add to the, the richness of any organisation. All, all, th all three of you uh, guys, you, you're self-starters, self-made. You, you run your own businesses. Mm -hmm. You're you responsible for yourselves. The, the problem for a big corporate is... The, it has a brand name uh, and you have who knows how many staff around the world mm. and whatever mm. conditions you employ they're supposed to represent you if you don't give them some sort of training then you might get that one person who's a, who has a, an adverse reaction to any situation any given situation absolutely and i think you know what jonathan you're you're quite right there's a there's a standard set of procedures they hadn't there were two guys actually i think with if we're referring to the same story um there were two guys they hadn't bought their coffees they were waiting for a pal they wanted to use the loo the manager said no called the cops 
okay they were then put under arrest their pal turned up and went what did they do and they hadn't done anything and it was it just went ballistic they were put under arrest and they were put in a in a cell for eight hours hours. so that was the outrage and it does need to be addressed even Mm -hmm. if it's just changing the policy okay uh i i i one of my favourite stores ever is Dunelm. I love Dunelm. Oh, I've just oh. come from there. Have you really? I just popped in there in Luton. <laughs> He's got a cushion under his arm. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was in the one here in Dunstable last week. I had to pick up something my wife, my, on my wife's orders on the way. Pick this up. And, like, <laughs> and you know, I don't know if they, they've trained him that way, but the, the lady that was serving me, she was really, she was just very, very nice, really pleasant. Oh. I thought that's a nice experience. And at the end, I just, they ask you for your postcode for this uh, survey. Mm. And I get the postcode and the, my email address. She says, you remember the radio? Uh-huh. Oh yeah, I, I'm on with Jonathan, with Paul, and with Jeremy. Uh-huh. So, <laughs> actually, Dunham was, um, I think, in the top five of that survey that we referred to earlier. Yeah, Customer really service, oh, uh-huh. really. Um, Twenty six minutes past six. We are going to talk very shortly about lending money to your children. Should you ask them to sign a contract? Can you turn your hobby into a business? Mobile phone market. But just before the travel news, let's get around it around the table. Jonathan, just remind listeners what it is you do. Um, I. Uh, I help relatively wealthy people become wealthier by managing their money. And before you ask, uh, Paul, I have asked him, can you help a poor person become rich? That's not possible. Damn it. I have, you, Never mind. I'm, I'm the queue ahead of you. <laughs> but you look after some interesting clients, and, you, you, and you've been doing it for a long time. You're very good at it. Uh, it's very good of you to say so. Not that you would know, because you haven't actually <laughs> seen the, the belly of what I've I do. Heard. But I have been around a long time, and uh, that uh, perhaps is says something for of itself. And, and Jonathan is a bit of a star, often to be heard on uh, big radio shows. Of course, uh, Radio 2. Mm. Thing, when he, when the Rob Peroni show, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, not quite. Not quite, but he gives some of my colleagues a very hard time. It was really entertaining to have you on the show. Uh, Jeremy, just to remind people what it is you do in your lovely call of the world, which is Potter's Bar. In Potter's Bar, I run Purple Marketing, and Purple Marketing is uh, is a small agency that helps businesses to promote themselves, thereby uh, enabling their owners to retire earlier or buy bigger cars or flashier holidays or generally enjoy their life more than they do now. But we don't need... There's a programme I saw last night on Channel 4, I can't remember, but they, they have a couple of, a couple of uh, characters and they, they strip everything out of their homes. Literally, and they, even including their, cl- their clothes. Even yeah. their clothes. Ooh. Even though they want, they even have to. So they, they see if they can live for twenty-one days without anything or the minimums. It's a ridiculous experiment. Apart from that young lady who had to venture out the house naked. Oh God, righty. Yes, it's quite a shock. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I missed the show. I have yeah. to say. Um, right, Mr. Ryan. Just so, how do you begin to describe it as you do? Okay, so for two two businesses, I'm an actor, but my my lifestyle business, which keeps me in the theatre, I have to say, is a a thing called improve on you and i teach people to speak at their best when it matters the most so presentation skills interview techniques sales and my newest arm interestingly is is a hobby that i'm turning into part of my business which is speaking and listening to people but maybe we'll discuss that later i think we should hey Uh, just say good evening to mark who says rob how come rob this is such a good thing how come rob they can get an old steam engine to run but can't fix the bedford to bletchley signals to work that's a very good (laughs) point Jonathan Davis, Paul Ryan, Jeremy Silverson. The great shame is that this hour is going to be over very, very quickly, and these three are very good. They should have been on for longer. <laughs> right, gentlemen, if you lend money to your children, should you ask for them? Should you ask them to sign a contract? Um, recurring story: This parents are parting with thousands of pounds to help their children get on the property ladder, but they can't afford to lend as much as they used to. The average parental contribution for home buyers this year will be eighteen thousand pounds. That's down seventeen percent from last year's twenty one. Thousand six hundred pounds. So, more than one in four property buyers are said to receive financial assistance from a friend or a family member. Normally, it's the bank of mum and dad. Jonathan Davies, you're the money guy. You lend money to your children, whether they ask or whether you volunteer it. Should you ask them to sign a contract? Should you draw up a contract? Not at all. Um, it, uh, on the basis that um, you agree with your child that uh, they will be paying you it back, whether in a lump sum or monthly, annually, whatever, you trust them. They're your children. Um, if they do, if the children decide to do something else, well, then um, then you have discussions. But no, 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 no contracts, not at all. But it's money, and it should never. Surely, it's just always whether it's whether even if it's in flesh and blood, you should sign a contract. Sign here in blood, <laughs> or else. What, what are you going to do? Sue them? You're going to take them to court? No, no. Um, there has to be trust within a family, and uh, if there isn't, then there's probably bigger issues. Mm. 
Um, Jeremy. I was so pleased that you asked Jonathan first, actually, <laughs> because I was really torn on this one. Uh, no, of course, we'd like to think that there's, there's trust and um, between family members, everything will be fine. Of course, there are instances where it turns out not to be fine. And, and you kind of think there ought to be some mechanism by which we can at least formalise the arrangement, even if it's uh, a bit of paper written down and signed by both parties. So at least, there, you know, if... Um, in the events that it did blow up, that there was something there, but I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe we just withhold it from the, the from the legacy. Are very trusting, I don't know what <laughs> yeah. but of course, for example, you're I'm slightly less trusting. Okay. You are know, slightly less trusting. trusting. Okay. Okay. For example, just very uh, your daughter comes here and says, "I want to. I need to get married. I need to buy a house. Can I wonder, can but bank of mine? Can you lend me fifteen thousand pounds? Okay, well, well, we'll lend you fifteen thousand pounds." Her partner then says, "You know, the goodness of the money. There's no paper." work why should we pay it back how do you prove it and that's why i say you know if it's a big amount of money and you're not certain about the relationship then just write i'm I'm, I'm really basing this entirely on judge rinder and what he would say (laughs) which would be just write something down have a letter that says you know we agree to do this and mm. uh, and both sign it. And then at least if there is any comeback, then it's there in black and white. So Seb, of course we'd love to see it. says, necessary. this is an ad hoc arrangement which cannot be sustained. At some point, the bank of mum and dad will run dry. As a parent of a 21-year-old, uh, I and my partner have set aside inheritance money of our own to help him get started in life. But this will cut into funds for our own pension quite significantly. Not all baby boomers are sitting on a fortune, and that includes us. Of course, the, the assumption seems to be that every parent every mm. bank of mum and dad as, as, as a resource there that you mm. can happily give your children 15 20 thousand pounds mm. so it doesn't always work that way no i mean i i agree very much with what jonathan's saying but i hear at the same time what jeremy's saying so i'm sort of sitting on the fence because when you're talking about family it is all about trust and ultimately a letter of agreement what does it mean it's totemic yes of course it sets out boundary lines but ultimately nah you, you're sort of you're giving it away knowing that it's gone in a certain way aren't you i also think that at the moment with the current climate it is for young people it's so difficult i mean you mentioned about marriage that's interesting because i thought we were talking specifically about buying a home no i just that's that's really good because that's a really complex question and if if that were the case then i can see the reason for a letter of agreement but with regard to setting aside money to put people into a house let them have it they've already got student loans that's one contract that is going to sit on their shoulders like a wet overcoat for years if you can help them do it but hang on we've got a generation i can't help mine by the way he's putting that in there but just we've got uh, they're not listening paul oh good (laughs) as tough as tough as it is as to when did they learn to stand on their own two feet because it was never Mm. easy for any of us Mm. around the table was it um, it was a great deal easier. You, you, you say the boomers haven't got uh, all that money. Well, the fact is, uh, those born between about 1946 and 1963 are literally the luckiest mm. generation in human history. F- for example... Um, if uh, you you traded up or indeed you bought for the first time 25 years ago, you, the house price in the south of England is now five times what you paid. Now, immediately people are shouting at your radio saying, yes, but interest rates were 15%. Well, they were 15%, but you borrowed, what, one two times, maybe two and a half times your income. Now it's literally 10 times income to buy a starter home. Mm. Jeremy? I, I, I don't know the answer to this. It's, um, you know, I, th- I think it comes back to the relationship and um, I, I, there is no right or wrong okay, answer well, I, to I, it. When we have this conversation on radio, okay, a lot of this is and I, uh, the sort of recurring messages. People say, yeah, we never had it easy, but we saved our money and we worked really hard. And a lot of people say, today's generation... Uh, they spend a lot more money because they've got a mobile phone contract, they want to go on holidays, they want to live the life of a celebrity lifestyle sort of thing. They spend more money, whereas we really had to save very, very hard. And a lot of listeners have no sympathy for the modern generation. They, they spend too much money to start with. My parents helped me with our, our first house. So, um, you know, I'm in much the same position as many of the youngsters are today. I'm very grateful for the help we had. Um, I probably could have done it myself, but it would have taken me a few few more years, and I was fortunate to be in that situation. Mm. So, uh, as a parent, I think if you can, you do, and if you can't, you, you can't. Mm. All right. 
Well, there we go. I, I completely agree with what you just said there. If you can, you can. And if you can't, you can't. That point that you made, actually, Rob, about, you know, kids spend more money, they don't hold on to it. It's very difficult for young people to get a job, you know. Um, even if it's... But not that I ever work cash in hand is the IRS listening. Oh, my God. But, you know, all the stuff we used to do as kids, I got a milk round when I was 11. So I got some financial understanding of what a pound was worth, etc. But you can't get a job until you're 16 now. So you're relying. It's become habitual to take money money out of your mum and dad's pocket look it's really really tough and it, it doesn't get easier i think you know going back to what you were saying jonathan it is tougher now i know they spend a lot more money that's where a little bit of discipline a little bit of money management education can come in handy as a parent that will help you as they get older it's coming up to 21 minutes to seven um gentlemen a study said to be published later this week is going to suggest that more people than ever are turning their hobbies and passions into careers i mean the numbers aren't huge here just 12 percent. but could you turn your hobby into a business or money making venture i'll come to you last mr ryan very good uh, mr jeremy <laughs> Yes. Um, so it seems to me as if there is a move towards doing what makes you happy. And I certainly see this in my kids' generation. Um, it, it seems like more of them are less, um, less willing to conform to the kind of norms that we grew up with. And in, certainly in my house, there was an expectation that one would go into a professional capacity in some way and that you would you know follow the system i think a, l a lot more kids today are recognizing that actually if they don't have a passion for the work they do then they're in the wrong job and that's more hobby? important what's your hobby is it something we can discuss it might I, be I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm incredibly <laughs> lucky in that i do design and i do write even as a hobby and that's my job and actually, I'm uh, I, a lot of the time it doesn't feel like work. So I'm one of the very lucky ones. But, you know, there are lots of people, you know, if I had been a dentist, which is what my dad wanted me to be, you could hardly say that that was my hobby. If It, if it would be very <laughs> weird if it was. Um, you know, I've done some other medical procedures, but Ooh. never dentistry, but as, as a hobby. Um, so, it, you know, I'm lucky in that respect. And I, we instilled in our kids, do what you really enjoy. Don't do what necessarily makes you the most money, you know, because you could do it for an awful long time. Okay. Um, Jonathan, um, I don't know what your hobby is, but this study will suggest this week that more people are trying to turn their hobby into their business. Well, that I think that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, I, I think it's the way the world is going with technology, artificial intelligence. Oh. The simple fact is that there are going to be fewer jobs in the future. Um, unfortunately, I estimate that globally we will lose hundreds of millions of jobs that you and uh, we round the table would uh, have naturally moved into. Um, they simply aren't going to be around in the future. In fact, we've talked previously about driverless taxis. They'll, they'll be here within a few years. Um, and if you have a, a passion if you have a hobby and you can make sustained money out of it that's an absolutely fantastic thing um any listeners thinking about it uh, i would simply say if you can turn your passion into an income you'll never work another day for the rest of your life mr ryan <clears throat> so i wrote a book i don't know if i've mentioned this before on your show <laughs> please mention it again called how to audition your way to success and my big message my big passion is to help young actors come to the realization we used to call it a second string but now it's very easy to set up your own business with what you are passionate about creativity is the new currency and actors a little bit like you were saying jeremy we were very lucky because we're doing what we love but it doesn't pay enough in any way shape or form so i'm trying to get young actors to really endorse this notion of do something you love as your second string, be it photography, writing, whatever it might be. Get your business cards, get your website, do it early, set that foundation stone right at the beginning of your career and nurture it as you grow as an actor. That's my philosophy. Is, is, is acting a, a business, a real... I mean, for for the, top, the elite, yes, very nice mm, indeed, of course. Mm. But it's not really, if someone comes here and says, I want to be an actor, you think, oh, yeah. come on, get a real job. Well, you know, 5% of actors only earn 
no, wait a minute, wait a minute, no, get this right. 38% of actors earn £5,000 a year. Mm. There's only 13% of professional actors that can say, I don't know how many of them are fibbing, but that they live only and solely on their acting income. It's a minefield. It's very, very difficult. Is it a business? No. It's an absolute love. It's a passion. It's a vocation. And if you're going to go into it, don't go into it empty-handed. Go in with another, another passion, another love, and start your own business. I've got a friend of mine. He's, he's a he's a big star in Sweden. He's, he's made over fifty TV series and films. He's a huge star, and he's been living and working in the UK with the same with a very, some very famous friends of his, trying to break into the English act to become an. You know, he speaks impeccable. They all speak impeccable mm-hmm. English from Sweden, of course. Um, just cannot get, a, a, you know, the kind of job that he would he would he would imagine. And he's he's a good looking guy, clever guy. Mm-hmm. He's been in so many things, all these sort of film noirs on movies he fought for. But he can't get it. Wow, really? Acting has got to be one of the toughest businesses in the world. It is. It's. I mean, <laughs> look, one look of, at the state of it. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> What, one of my little ind- idiosyncrasies is I like to read the credits at the end of a TV show or a movie. And when I see a name that I recognise, that I actually think to myself, what have they been doing since? And it's amazing how many had leading parts 10, 15 years ago. You never hear from them now. What happens to them? Where do they go? Do they go back into rep, earning 200 quid a week? Is that what happens? I don't know. I just don't know. We, we, some of the, the acting thing has taken over this notion of hobbies becoming, um, you know, your, your, your new life's work. What do they do? They struggle. I mean, that's mm. why. And that's why I want young actors to think about it seriously, have something else and go into the business with it. But going back to your point, if you've got something you love, turn it into a business, go for it. Because there's never been a better or easier time to set up your own business. Sorry. I, I guess this is a, a question for Paul and for Rob. Um, given the proliferation of television channels, channels mm. and other the broadcast media i would have thought that there would be so many more opportunities for actors these days is that not the case for very little money yes yeah. the top stars you hear the you always hear you know, you know angelina whatever gets 50 million dollars yes but the the other act all the hundreds of other actors on the film mm. will probably not very much worth at all but does it mean there are not more opportunities, at least? There are certainly more opportunities, but there are so many, many more actors. Mm-hmm. There really are. Theatre's diminished. They're all hoping to get more telly work, more film work. So there's a strange trade-off. I remember Reginald Marsh, who used to play Terry, Terry Scott's boss in Terry and June. He once said to me, you know, I'd, I'd rather like it if there were just a little bit more work for everybody, even, even if it just meant a little less money. Well, we've got it. Maybe um, we should cull them. Maybe we should. Don't start with me. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> we will take some travel news. While we do that, I can just gently remind, uh, listen, you can follow me on Facebook. There's a, a Roberta Prinny Show Facebook page. And on that page, there's a little uh, 15, 12 or 15 second video of me acting, uh, lying on a, a, I think it's a unicorn lilo being eaten by a giant shark. No, don't even ask how that so the gentlemen have seen the video of me acting and so they're all suitably oh, impressed me. <laughs> have you got another passion you can turn into a business well no <laughs> here's the answer to that uh, what happens uh, twice a year there's a big sort of event on in, in London called Comic Con the, the, the big big sort of and my teenage son annoys his dad can you take me I'm bringing a friend I'm thinking okay so Saturday morning 8 o'clock it's, it's 6 to five other five other teenage dropping six foot tall teenagers. I think how do I get one of the car? So we go to these events. Like we go in, and what happens is they thanks dad come and pick us up later obviously because <laughs> so i spend the whole day and it's all about comics and films so i spent and i said have you been on all, all the have you done all the green screens and they don't do anything they just walk around <laughs> moping and <laughs> grunting each other and I, of course oh, i do all the rides i do all the f- oh. and end up doing some green screen stuff <laughs> but you were impressed with the hand movement in the lilo oh it was brilliant it's quality, you know. it was <laughs> second to none you were marvelous <laughs> lovely <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, has the mobile phone market peaked? Um, shares in tech reader Dixon's car phone slumped 27% this morning when I looked. After issuing a profits warning, the group will shut 92 car phone warehouse stores this year as it warns that customers are hanging on to older phones for longer. They still make a lot of money, uh, but they are shutting a lot of stores and the this, this, this share price is, is stopping. Jonathan, has, has the mobile mm. phone market peaked? Um, th- that that's too big a question to know the answer to. What we know 
is that the production of new mi- mobile phones in the Far East um, has fallen materially in the last couple of years and um, Apple uh, forecasts for their sales for I- I- iPhones have been materially lower than they expected them to be. Um, um, there's no doubt, as you just said, uh, people are holding on to their phones for longer, and rightly so. What's the point of changing it every two years? Um, they, they last longer than that. Um, um, globally, we will s- there will still be a rise in mobile phone sales in the UK uh, and in the West. Um, yeah, um, maybe now that I'm thinking about it, it wasn't something I thought about before. Maybe we have um, peaked for the long term, but there'll be more and more uses of mobile technology. We will become even more dependent upon our mobile phone. This is driven by the technology. If there's a big advance in technology, then the sales of that brand will just leave. Yep. But until we get that, at the mm. moment, it's, it seems to be yep. stagnating. Um, Jerry, what's your take on this? Are, are we kind of, do you think we're reaching the kind of peak at the moment? I think we probably are with mobile phones because I think we're ready to take the next step and um, you know there's, there's no doubt that a number of things have coincided one being um, a bit of austerity and you know, depressed the economy the other is that mobile phones are of a much higher quality than they used to be and so they do last longer and that is also combined with the fact that people are starting to consume information and access information in more diverse ways. So it might be through their watch. And I understand that at the moment they still need their phone in order to get it through the watch. But wearable technology and other technologies are starting to creep in so that people will be able to access information and communicate in a variety of different ways. And that might be through um, the Google Glass type arrangements um there are any number of ways in which we're going to be able to communicate that don't necessarily involve us having a phone and after all a mobile phone you know most of the time we're actually not using it as a phone we're using it as an email a computer a television a cinema um a compass a, a sat nav and all those other things so yeah it's become so much more than that uh, paul <clears throat> Well, I think you made a really interesting point, Rob, about, you know, innovation is not significant enough to justify spending that extra money. It just isn't. What what was the new, God forgive me, but the new iPhone, what was the innovation there? Something that actually didn't work when they went to press with it was face recognition. Oh, yes. It didn't work. And and the headphones without any cables. Yeah, that which people lose all over the shop. I think there's an, an element here of the novelty has worn off and the excitement it's not novel anymore and it's interesting what you're saying jeremy about the next step we want the next thing this incredible explosion of technology this social and cultural revolution and already we're tired of it quite frightening in a way well then the next move will be to go to 5g and we'll probably have that in two or three years can i ask what that means it means um a a speed of accessing uh, the internet a um, hundred times quicker than we have it currently. It's, it'll be literally like um, blinking your eye. Okay. Wow. Uh, math says, Rob, my parents worked very hard for little money and put the work ethic into all three of their children. I aimed higher because of that, and now they are happy in retirement. I would, I would prefer they spent the money on themselves as if they do have some left to give, give it to their grandchildren, help them bring their kids up to respect people and try hard, and they'll be greedy. Money's a great deposit for happiness, but it won't buy it won't buy without love. Math, thank you. Um, this tech, and thank you for all the so many comments dave the guard this is rob i quit my career in engineering as it changed into computer control i turned my passion for gardening into a business never been happier or fitter perhaps the income isn't as good but i don't i don't have to pay to go to the gym david the guard i wish you well <laughs> right um Paul, where can people find out more about you and your books? Oh, well, if you go to www.improveonyou.co.uk, you can find out about me. If you go onto Amazon, you can find both my books, How to Win, How to, what is it? I've forgotten it now. It's so long ago since I've written it. How to, uh, what is it? How to network your way to success. Good. Or how to audition your way to success. And coming up soon, how to talk your way to success. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Um, Jeremy, where can people find out more about you and Purple Marketing? Uh, they can call me. They can call me on 07710723532 or they can go to my website, which is purple-marketing.net and they can have a look at any of the 25 videos that I've just launched on YouTube. Lovely. Um, Jonathan? My company is uh, Jonathan Davis Wealth Management, um, but uh, I think uh, some listeners might be interested in my weekly podcast called The Booms and Busts Show. 
um, which you can easily find on Audio Boom or iTunes. Um, it's about economics, investing, and a bit of politics. Uh, just a, a, a money question, if I may. A bit of turmoil in Italy. Uh, if something happens there, could that affect? The, the money around the rest of Europe or us as we know it? Well, a, a few years ago, Greece was the problem child and that did create a, a, a quiver in, in the global system. Italy is a multiple the size of Greece. I, we will not know whether or not Italy is going to be problematic for the global system until more comes out. So I, no one can really okay. say right now. Uh, we may, if we get time, end with two stories. But this one certainly, it's, it, oh, I've called it the Great Carrot Cape. I don't know if you heard this. Ooh. It's a great story. Uh, supermarkets have been trying to work out uh, why they've sold over 800 million carrots in the past five years. They've had more carrots than they had in stock. And, uh, and people think, well, maybe this is down to a healthy boom. People are buying more carrots because they want to be healthy. And then it suddenly dawned on someone what's going on. And this is driven by the self-service tills, where you you scan your you scan or weigh whatever you put it, and then you put it in a basket. Now, what's been happening is uh, people have been scanning, for example, a bag of carrots at 27p. Uh, and then instead of putting the carrots in the shopping bag, they've been putting four avocados, which are much more expensive. Oh. Now, I have been pointing this out for a while for the self the supermarkets, I mean, because you could technically, I mean, it's a crime, you'd go to prison, mm. but you could scan a 3 99 bottle of wine and actually scan, pay 3 99 put that to one side and actually put a £25 bottle of wine in your bag. They don't work it out because they've got no people there. Mm. Um, it's the, it starts with a great carrot caper, Jonathan. <laughs> the supermarkets, a bit, they don't realise this might happen, do you think? I'm sure they do. Um, they're, however, developing self-checkout, self-scanning, because ultimately it's going to save them much more in staffing. I, I, just literally a few weeks ago, um, I was in one of the big stores which had 50 or 60 checkouts, um, but there were only 10 or yeah. a dozen people manning them. So, you know, I'm talking about hundreds of millions of jobs going over the next years. There's one store, 30 or 40 jobs gone. Mm. Multiply that by how many stores and then globally and so on. Um, uh, the, the stores eventually want to move to what Amazon is doing uh, in Seattle, um, where its HQ is. They have... Um, they have a working store now since last year where there are no checkouts. There are, however, hundreds of cameras. And as soon as you pick something off the shelf, it automatically goes onto your Amazon account. Wow. And that is eventually where grocery stores are going to go. Uh, Jeremy, for the time being, yes. you, 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 not, not suggesting anyone should do this no, because it, it's a criminal offence to go to prison I, 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 for I, a bag I, of carrots. It was I terrible. I was made aware of this about an hour or two ago when I was listening to the Roberto Peroni show on, on BBC <laughs> Three <laughs> Counties Radio and you were talking about it then and I thought, what a damn good idea. <laughs> um, I, I never knew this existed. Um, I mean, it does seem that, that there is obviously a degree of... Um, of wastage, shall we say, within the supermarket. So yes, the trade-off is we need we can we can employ fewer people, um, but you would have thought that there would be some checking mechanism so, so, or kind of random some really check. Interesting text. And, you, and you, you can tell this. There's there's one supermarket that I know of in in in, in one part of the region where they have a, a particularly high problem. That's why they sort of tag legs of lamb. And because what happens is people run in, for example, kids they run in, grab a leg of lamb, and leg it out the store. And the security guard's thinking, mm. I'm not going to bother. Yeah. It's why you can't buy. Razor, you try and buy razor blades after a certain, you can't it's a grown adult you you have to go and ask for them because they're, they're tucked away because they're 15 odd pounds yeah. and it's a high value item it used to be wow. that cheese was actually the uh, parmesan was, yeah parmesan was the big yes, thing that yes. people yes. would steal wow. from really? the supermarket four, four or and five I, quid I, you could put you it in your pocket I live, in, I live in a bubble because I didn't realise <laughs> this existed thinking, to that extent. I didn't know none of this existed before. No. But we're I all mean, going across to Asda afterwards, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> you create a diversion, Paul. Can I'll you, can you imagine, you like, mate. Can you imagine the mugshot Beverage Police will put up of us for? <laughs> well, they can have my publicity <laughs> photograph if that's right with you. But I can't stand these these new, uh, you know, newfangled. I don't like it because we lose our people contact. And if I were to do any shoplifting, I'd just take out my <laughs> overcoat with the big pockets. Do you know old school? That's all I'm saying. <laughs> You're going to do it, do it properly. Exactly. <laughs> I did say. Nostalgia for the, the old days. These three are very, very good.